Good evening. Uh, welcome to tonight's monthly dialogue uh, talk. I am delighted and honored to see all of you here. And uh, it's wonderful to see so many new faces. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome our guest, thank you, uh, about whom I will have a couple of things to say in a minute. Uh, before I do so, however, uh, please allow me to mention a couple of uh, housekeeping points. Uh, if I could ask you to uh, please either turn your phones off or put them on silent in case they go off during the uh, talk. A summary of tonight's talk will be on uh, the CIRS website uh, within the week. That is cirs.georgetown.edu. Uh, uh, if you uh, are new to the Center for International and Regional Studies. We have sign-in sign sheets right outside. Uh, please make sure to give us your contact info so we can um, get a hold of you uh, for future events. For example, uh, our next monthly dialogue is on the 17th of February, um, uh, featuring the postdoctoral fellow at the Center for International and Regional Studies. Let me welcome also our dean, uh, Professor Gerd Nahneman. Uh, 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 welcome, uh, dean. Be nice to him. He's my boss. <laughs> and um, uh, and uh, there, are, I don't see any empty seats, Dr. Sita Rahman, a testament to your, uh, uh, your talk. Uh, but if there were empty seats, I'd ask that you would uh, uh, get a little friendlier just in case um, uh, for us to make some room uh, for those who might be coming in late and be victims of the Doha traffic. Let me introduce our distinguished guest for the evening uh, who really does not need an introduction in Doha. We're all familiar with him, a uh, renowned figure, notable figure in our wonderful city, but allow me to say a couple of things. Dr. R. Sitharaman is the Group Chief Ex Executive Officer of Doha Bank. He's a recipient of multiple awards and also multiple doctorates from leading universities around the world, including a PhD in global governance from the European University and a doctorate of law from Washington College. He is a chartered accountant and holds certificates in IT systems and corporate management. You are putting me to shame <laughs> uh, with uh, <laughs> my own qualifications. He has been named best CEO in the Middle East and also world leader business person. And he is also a recipient of Gulen's Excellence Award as a phenomenal banker. A regular commentator on international finance in global media outfits such as BBC, CNN, Fox, CNBC, Sky News, ABC, and Bloomberg, he has transformed Doha Bank, as you know, into one of the best performing banks in the Middle East region. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sita Rama. Thank you very much. I should mention Dr. Sitha Rahman will uh, speak for about 30 minutes. He has kindly agreed to take questions and answers. And he will talk to us about the topic of corporate social responsibility. And as you will see, and as you will hear during his talk, Doha Bank believes in corporate social responsibility right. in, light, in, in terms of their various activities. This isn't just a talk for tonight. This is part of a longer commitment to corporate social responsibility. What a generous introduction. <laughs> Very generous. The Dean, distinguished guests, honored guests from United Nations, students, faculties, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure and privilege for me to be an integral part of this interesting and exciting session. Before coming to this meeting, I had a very intense deliberation with my board. We were concluding the 2013 numbers. And I was also projecting the next three-year plan. 
And shareholders, representatives, they have the right questions to ask, and they asked, oh, why are you are conservative in your outlook when it comes to extrapolating numbers? I said, the world has changed. The world has changed on account of globalization. The world has also changed on account of re-regulation. This is a key. What was once called deregulation has become re-regulation. As bankers, sustainability is the name of the game. With a boom or downturn, as an institution, we manage to sustain every year the graph is only ascending. It has never seen the ups and downs. And I was trying to articulate how the, the game changes happen within the financial service. As I said, the deregulation has become uh, re-regulation, conservative, cautious, regulatory approach to see consumers are protected. Financial innovation has gone beyond definition. That's why a financial crisis has cropped up. In substance, it is globalization, it is re-regulation, it's technology and consumerism is setting the new world order. The question remains, how do you converge on a business model, whether you run a corporate or a country or a continent or the world? I have the privilege of having the ex-president of the United Nations, again, president of the global civilization with us as an honored guest. He knows politics and economics have to converge to make sure policy pronouncement are adding value to gross welfare, to the mass. What is sustainability? I have to answer to you multiple questions. If I start answering to you some of the questions which, which is substantive, perhaps we have done this session. What are the changes in terms of financial economies? What are the new regulatory measures which are going to redefine the financial services? How this financial crisis has become a human crisis? How do we make sure we not only we create a better world, we create better citizenship to have sustainability as a long-term wish? How do we understand the dynamics of changing markets? How do we make sure markets are not gambling grounds? How we are going to converge, as I said, politics and economy? How we are going to set in new initiatives which are responsive to see United Nations mission, whether eradication of extreme poverty, gender equality, environment sustainability, primary health care, education, global collaborations, how these certain measures which are not yet fully fulfilled, Ambassador was with me in the car, he said, the UN Millennium Development Goals which were set in, is, it needs altercation in substance. In 2015, we need to redefine it. What are the changes which are likely to come to see a new world order creating new opportunities? And again, what about the climate change? Is alleviation of poverty, climate change, or integral or not? How do we ensure with the changing demographic structure, we have supply chain in terms of food security? How are we going to make sure what's happening at a global level percolates in real order to see consumers are protected, continents are protected, Countries are protected, corporates are protected to see name of the game as sustainability comes in without endangering the solvency. These are the questions we need to answer. What does it mean to set in new vision? How do we redefine ourselves to create a better world and better citizenships? This is what I'm going to answer to you. As a practitioner in a bank, it was all right when 2008 when Lehman Brothers and Wachovia or Washington Mutual, uh, Bastions was getting realigned. Lehman Brothers 78 times leveraged their balance sheets. 
That's not ordinary. We lost ethical and moral governance in terms of financial service. The investment banks created toxic products. They got it certified by rating agencies, guilted AAA, rolled over, they sold. It has infected not only the financial economies, even real economies got infected. It transcended borders. It's not confined to the United States alone. Again, Northern Rock, RBS, in London, in Asian markets, the impact was minimal. But the world at large has realized financial economies have to convert as real. Real economies have to redefine the scope and performance. Capitalism has changed. Capitalism is altercating its form and substance. Socialism is getting redefined. Mixed economies are the game changes. We have seen the emerging markets incrementally producing over 60% of the gross domestic product in terms of global growth. And these economies have to be integral part of the order of inclusive growth. That's why G7 has become G8, G8 has become G20. Today, global governance is getting redefined. That change is good for the world. The United Nations president is here. He organizes a conference, global conference, in May 2012. 2012, I mean, 18th of May. World economists, politicians, and again, bankers like me, and he was chatting along with Secretary General His Excellency Ban Ki-moon. I was trying to articulate, this crisis is an opportunity for the new world order. What's wrong in converting as real? Why should we mask ourselves as, or pretend ourselves as professionals? Financial engineering, if it goes beyond definition, it's going to infect the real economies. The objective remains sustainability. The vision remains ethical and moral, you govern it with value-driven purpose. And that's what the name of the game. How do we evolve policymakers to come to terms? How do we ensure policymakers are going to understand the dynamics of it? What has changed in the last five years? The liquidity crisis has moved into a funding crisis. Funding crisis is moved into Sovereign crisis and solvency issue cropped up. That's why you had Greece, your Iceland completely melted. And clearly, it's not confined to Greece alone. There were conceptual errors, design errors in Europe. By birth, Euro is a deformity. The monetary policy is centralized, and fiscal policy is decentralized. Politics and economics never got converged today. There's a contagion impact. It's not confined to Greece alone. The master criteria was set in with purpose. You have to contain your deficit financing. You have to make sure your gross to GDP is 60%. That was a dictum. That was the measurement set in as a convergence criteria for enlarged euro. The result? No country within the European definition has fulfilled the obligation except Germany. How could we expect financial stability there? These are not fictions. These are real. America is still reeling under pressure. If you look at the, the bigger picture, trillions of dollars of debt, the gross debt to GDP is over 100%. And again, deficit, we know we need to reduce it. There are contentious issues in terms of budget resolutions between politicians. How are you going to converge to make sure gross welfare comes to common man? The crisis has set in right kind of missions to sustain values for long-term prospects. That's why the banks were banks' deposits were guaranteed. It was unprecedented for me to see in Cyprus that is also withered away by European politicians. These are some of the extraordinary scenes you have gone through in the last four years. It's not only man in the Wall Street, you need to protect the man in the Main Street. 
That's the slogan. That's why new regulation, the light switch regulation, failed to understand the systemic risk. It didn't recognize the auditors were at fault. They certified the balance sheet. Trading agencies, as I said, they were at fault. How do you ensure accountability? How do you trust your financial institutions if these kind of calamities can happen? How do you expect Lehman Brothers to get away with 78 times leveraging? How could they sell investment products around the world? Ask about it. The reason why I'm, I'm trying to tell you all this is to recognize the new world order is good for the world. This is going to create a better world. This crisis is an opportunity in substance. What has changed? This crisis has converted a new framework, converting the financial economies to real. That's why Financial Stability Board was set in. This Financial Stability Board was inclusive. It's not confined to G8 alone. G20 came in. It was in London, Pittsburgh, Korea, off late in St. Petersburg still evolving universal standards. It was a universal problem. You need universal solutions. Universal standard in terms of accounting, valuation, securitization, these are not options. Today, we live in an interconnected, interdependent world, Facebook world we are living in. We are all content providers. The best way to go about is to recognize what's happening in one part of the world resonates in other parts of the world. We are not location-centric, we are information-centric. That we need to understand. Whichever be the part of the world today you are in, you know what's happening in one part of the world directly impacts the other. Look at quantitative easing. The liquidity crisis was fixed through printing money, improving the liquidity. The world is not going to grow by accommodative monetary policy. It's a fiction. You improve the cash flow. That's what has happened. Key one, key two, key three. Federal Reserve take an accommodative monetary policy as a substance to see liquidity comes in. Result, the money supply was more, the stock markets were inflated, and world over, stock market was booming. That's not sustainable. That's not going to be the, the real. What goes up has to come down. Then when you start resetting the button in terms of monetary policy, when Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke, then he was mentioning on June 19th that he is going to cut down the bond buying programs, the result was deceleration. Look at the impact on the financial markets. Financial markets were simple gambling grounds. If you print money, you weaken the currency. By weakening the currency, you will be increasing the trade. China has kept in as an administered currency for 30 years. America was questioning the wisdom. Printing money is equally <coughs> damaging to the world for sustainability. And what has happened is to recognize this deceleration when the bond buying program was supposed to be put to rest in a progressive manner, effective 2014, the currency market got into high volatility. Currency market and commodity markets are intertwined. If the currency is weak, people hedge the risk by buying commodity futures. If dollar index is weak, petrodollars, Fed oil price will go up. Why? You will hedge the risk by buying oil futures. That's pure equation, pure logic. Financial markets are nothing but gambling grounds even today. By political pronouncement, uh, Binomics was invented in 2012. Why? As an export-driven economy, Japan was not performing well. Inflation was not visible. The growth was not visible. Recession was technically on. They are not able to compete in the export market. Korea was performing. Japan was not performing. What was the binomics? Weaken the currency. 
Go to open market operation. Trillions of yen will print in the open market. Same logic, what America has done, right from 2008 onwards in terms of accommodatory monetary policy, Japan politicians could emulate. The result, Japan was picking up. Throughout 2013, the market was up. Abenomics was, Abenomics was recognized. The Nikkei was up over 50%. Is it real? Is it sustainable? So where are we taking this world? Where are we taking this world in terms of political framework or policy pronouncement? How do you sustain global growth? How do you sustain global trade? How do you sustain global investments? How do you sustain global banking? These questions need to be answered still. There is no silver bullet solutions for it. If you look at the, the bigger picture, the public-private partnership model is a solution. When it comes to your financial institutions, more than the shareholders' money, it's public money, customer deposits. If I take, for example, Doha Bank, the shareholders' money is over 10 billion, say 11 billion, that's the number. The customer deposit is 35 billion. Who is at stake now? It is the public at stake. The lending is 33 billion. So you can, you can see the equation. Shareholders' money is 11 billion. 33 billion is lending. Public deposit is 35. So you can see whether you run a private institution or a local institution, it is public, it is global. So, this crisis has really revealed <coughs> ensuring common man's protection is important. Trillions of dollars of credit card frauds were manifested. Institutions were overcharging. The pricing was not acceptable. It was atrocious. Financial institutions were gambling on these things, on common man's trust. And precisely the reason why Today, a regulatory reorganization has taken place. Some of the changing business models, investment banks and conventional banks, they get redefined. That's why you have Paul Walker's rule was invented. You don't gamble with public money. You are a financial institution, you have to have absolute governance as a structured principle. That's where we, we come in as a solution. Global governance has to recognize all this policy pronouncement. That's precisely the reason today G20 has pronounced things are changing. Things are changing for good. Things are changing. It's good for the world. What's happening today is this crisis was good. Some of the initiatives taken today by G20 are good. What did they say? They said, Universal standard has to be ensured in terms of tax compliance. We used to have offshore model, onshore model. I don't know. We are bankers, we use the language. Offshore models are nothing but tax evasion models. You beat the regulations, you set up an offshore. There's nothing as offshore. Nothing should be as offshore. Trillions of dollars of American Tax evasion was responsible for you to pronounce today FATCA. And again, we also have to recognize offshore should be completely contained. Parallel systems which were defrauding the world, regulatory compliance needs to be put to rest and you have to bring them to task and you have to scrap the, the offshore. Everything is onshore. It's an integral part of the unified framework. And that's precisely the reason it was pronounced that you will have a real value in terms of character and commitment when it comes to social responsibility. Universal standard we need to bring in. One part of the world has got different accounting systems. Other part of the world, different accounting systems. How do you reconcile capital rules? Institutions were operating, financial institutions were operating with 
less capital. The Gulf states, I'll give you an example. If Lehman Brothers could leverage 76 times, my balance sheet is leveraged today eight times. A good financial institutions can leverage between 10 to 12 times maximum. Basel I, Basel II was pronounced to make sure you play with your shallowest money, not with the public. That was the definition why Basel was invented. Basel II was pronounced in 2006. Good financial institutions, good corporates, good countries enforce Basel II. Today, we have Basel III. What does it Basel III states? Basel III dictates conser conservative buffer for you to absorb the systemic risk instead of evading the systemic risk. That's precisely the reason Basel III is not accepted by many countries still. Off-balance sheet securitization is the biggest fraud financial institutions were making. I'm not being critical. I'm telling you the facts. I'm a practitioner. The last five, six years which I've gone through is I, I'm privileged to go through this, this experience because once in a lifetime you will get it. After 1930 depressions, we've gone through it. But it's, it's creating new sustainable missions for everyone to recognize. That's an opportunity. That's what I'm trying to articulate to you. <coughs> Understand the dynamics of this change. Now today, the capital rules are getting changed. Eight times, if I say Doha Bank, or 10 times another bank in this region, 78 times banks were leveraging. What does it mean? Many of the balance sheets, if you look at it, if you start redefining in terms of Basel III, they all have to re recapitalize their financial institutions. Additional instruments were created to make sure you subverge the convergence rules in terms of capital norms. Today, we are still struggling to set the financial house in order, not necessarily in this part of the world. Having said that, Qatar is a telling story for you to recognize. October 8, 2008, I was with the American ambassador's residence for a dinner. The finance minister, and now the central bank governor, and me were having dinner in Qatari ambassador's residence. What should be the norm for Qatar? Qatar is financially stable and functional. It runs in fiscal surplus, current account surplus. The vision was right to pronounce next day morning. Next day morning, the Qatar government has announced public-private partnership model. Every single financial institution will have between 10 to 20 percent capital participation. That's to establish consumer confidence establish global confidence on the system. The market deflections were very many. When you have financial markets become gambling grounds, speculations plays a role. Properties were crushing. In Dubai, it was a major crisis. I was in BBC, nearly 40 minutes interview in, in October, December to, October 2009. Dubai Group, Nakhil, Dubai Holdings, because property boom was visible between 2004 to 2007 everywhere in the world. When banks stopped the tap, lending money, credit expansion was not there, the retail mortgage was not there, the market started collapsing. Because their capital rules are impacted with the laws and provisions they have to take for irregular accounts, they stop lending. The market started deflecting in different forms. That's precisely the reason the banks were instituted as a culture doing the stress test. What happens if the market deflects 10%, 20%, 30%, 40% in terms of real estate? What happens if it is a stock market? If it is 10 or 20 or 30, do you have enough capital to run this institution? It has happened. This market is down by 40%. Every single institution was producing not less than 25% return on equity. This market in March 2009 was down by 40%. The Qatar government came to rescue. They came with a scheme and say, we will buy back all these investments. Your risk profile will improve, your liquidity improve, your cash flow will improve, and your profitability will improve. The result, the government made big money. They cleaned the balance sheets because at the original cost, they took it. They made huge profit. We all know this is a temporary situation. Real economies will sustain the name of the game. Financial stability will come. Sustainability will come. A real institution will survive. If you call 2002 to 2007 as, as a boom, 2008 to date, if it is 
under stress, we as an institution, go and look at the numbers of Doha Bank between 2002 to today. Tomorrow morning, I'll have, you'll have the results of 2013. The graph is always ascending. The reason why I'm saying is sustainability as, as it introduced, it is not a conceptual frame. You have to practice it. You have to have policy pronouncement, whether you run a socially responsible mission as a corporate head or a country head, you have to practice social responsibility. Then only you will take care of all the stakeholders. Society at large has to come in prospects for every single policy decisions. The deflection of the market can always happen. The world will go up and down. The global trade is still not recovered. But technically, pre-crisis, if you look at it, if you make a GDP of 5%, the trade should be double. 10% should be your trade. That's the norm. That's how the global mechanism was driving its balance. It is equal now. It shows global trade was impacted because of the currency market. These are some of the reflections we have to understand to make sure we bring in sustainability as a committed mission. It doesn't end there. You have to necessarily understand what's happening on the global warming and climate change. Environment sustainability is a very, very important issue. We should be worried about our children and grandchildren. Rising temperature, United Nations framework was set in, in 1992. Kyoto Protocol was pronounced. There were contentious issues between developed world and developing world. And the accord was never fulfilled. The protocol was never, compliance architecture was never accepted by developed nations. Again, they convinced the global community. Bali was pronounced in 2009. Nothing has happened. Copenhagen in 2010, nothing has happened. Then Mexico, Cancun. In June 2012, he was in Rio. I was talking to President Nasser at the time. He was the president of the United Nations at the time. See, it was an extraordinary situation. Now, last a couple of months before I was in Warsaw, Poland, still we are coming to terms as far as climate change is concerned. Rising sea levels, increasing temperature, extinction of animals, produ production of enormous amount of carbon emissions. How are we going to fix it? How do you ensure sustainability comes in unless you look at alternates? 45% of the world oil, 20-25% of the world gas comes from this place. The GDP is running in great momentum. Investable surplus, current account surplus. These are disinvested as a structured solutions. But you also have to recognize how are we ensuring we create a better world. That's precisely the reason world over today, renewables are coming in. Solar, wind, biofuel, biomass. These are not ordinary requirements. This zone itself is arid zone, 365 days sunshine. We need to bring in measures which are responsive to make sure we tap the solar energy and recycle them. Today, Qatar is a telling story in the global market. The reason why we kept as a green mission, as an institution, as I said, I need to practice. In 2004, I know, when the institution was getting redefined, we said, first bank to pronounce as a green bank. <laughs> there are some of the transcripts which you have, you can have a, a good look at it. We said we'll be a committed green bank. Ambassador was kind enough to, uh, the president was kind enough to recommend me as a good, you know, goodwill ambassador. He saw in a Gulf country where 45% of the world oil, 20-25% of the world gas comes on, somebody talking about green. It's a purposeful mission to make sure Catholic children and grandchildren are well off. The region is well off. The world at large exploring the carbon neutral options. There is solution within us. We have to look at these options. It is evolving to be a fine combination. We didn't have solutions. In fact, there is a possibility of investing with the investable surplus what Qatar or the Gulf states, which runs in trillions of sovereign funds, to invest in multiple ventures. That's what is happening today. Qatar is investing in in Amazon, Qatar is investing in Warren Island in $400 million was invested in Warren, in Australia. Azad Food Australia was pronounced. 
these are some of the initiatives coming up. Why? People look at sustainability is the name of the game. Are we <coughs> sustaining our credibility as you as an individual, we as a, as a team, we all as a society? That thought has to come from within. Look at the food security issue. The list goes on. Some of the endangering issues which we have, if you realize, you will not sleep for a while. You have to take personal commitment to testify these initiatives are really responsive. Food security today, the world population 6.8 billion will turn into 9.1 billion by 2050. You need 70% incremental productivity in terms of food. Where is it going to come from? Where is it going to come from? What are the solutions? What is the solution for this country? Where is the water? We are, okay, we, de we are desanalyzing it. How are we going to make sure we have sustainable supply chain in terms of food? It's not only oil you cannot drink. You need water. You need food supply. Agricultural commodities you need. Agricultural produce you need. How are we going to make sure poverty-driven countries are going to sustain? How are we going to eliminate poverty, extreme poverty? We are all, we have to think about it. That's precisely the reason food security, United Nations food security program comes in perspective. Every nation now started realizing these are some of the positive developments. While we recognize the challenge ahead of us, we also recognize the opportunity. We are coming to terms. We are recognizing this issue. We are understanding the interconnectivity to create a better world. We have solution within us. We have a shared vision. We have the shared leadership in terms of global governance. That's the name of the game. I always tell my team, I have multinational community as my team members. Professional management is not anything but shared vision and shared leadership. I was telling today morning, control is not power. Giving your strength to others and making sure shared vision comes in, shared leadership comes in, corporate governance comes in. Recognizing the opportunity to make sure you convert people to become real. Ensuring you are socially committed, morally and ethically committed, set by practicing examples. You as a person, we as a team, can set in right kind of mission to sustain your enterprise, you as a person. Internal integration is required. That's where you need to understand poverty and also affluence together. Giving a rich person is making money to, it's an opportunity for him to give it back. Then the world will sustain. We live in an interconnected world. Even marriage, I always say, it's interconnected. It's a combination of two families. You don't marry two individuals. Rich and poor, strong and weak, you come together. Share the, the smiles and fears to make sure if you are affluent, give it to others who are needy. That's not, that's a character. Then only sustainability comes in, happiness comes in. Happiness comes in only by structured, principle-centered policy, you as a person. Then we create a better world. That's the way of creating long-term sustainable happiness. Individuals are not different from institutions. Institutions are not different from countries or continents. A good person can only be a good professional. Group of good professionals can create good corporates. Group of good corporates can create good society. Group of good society can create good nation. Group of good nations can create United Nations. <coughs> then the world is going to be sustainable. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your care. <laughs>